So you notice I put the uh, Union Jack ahead of the uh, Stars and Stripes. So if I get, off, get, get a good start, I'll get on the right foot here. Right? And I, I'm sorry, Ken, if the Scottish flag wouldn't fit on the slide, but next time, I'm, next time I'll make sure it does. Um, so to move, to move forward, um, my company's been an ACRA member firm since 2004. Uh, I didn't get actively involved in, until 2014. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, um, introduce somebody who's here today, Chris Dorr. He was you were, one year after ACRA was formed, you, you joined it. You've been president of ACRA too, so it's great to have you here. And you're probably better qualified than me to give this, so are you ready? <laughs> There's another shot for you. Um, so anyway, some of you might remember in 2021, I gave a virtual presentation introducing ACRA, some of it which is repeated here. Um, but I thought given the theme of the conference, it would be great to come here in person with my colleague Ellen Turco to give this presentation, which will try very hard to squeeze into whatever the allotted time frame is anymore. I think I've lost now. Um, so next slide, you know, you, know the, um, you know the title of it, so I'll move on. Um, but I will say one thing. Um, the year 1966, which I'll bring up again later, of course. Um, as, as you might recall, you know, for you, you sports enthusiasts with long memories, which I have, 1966 was an important year for England, but was also a milestone for the establishment of the cultural resource management industry in the US. Um, so what I would like to do first is, is sort of in a light introduction to describe very generally what led to what is now a billion dollar industry in the US. Um, by focusing on important post-World War II developments, including social and economic trends, that one could argue led in part to the passage of the National Stock Preservation Act. Following that, Ellen Turco will describe the regulations um, which led directly to the growth of our industry in the US. And then I'll finish up with a summary, a summary of our trade association, why it was formed, how it operates, the benefits to its members, and the recent development of initiatives, including the association's partnership program that is really responsible for us being here today. Um, finally, we'd, we'd like to finish up with some general ideas about how we might be able to work together in the future. I hope to get some feedback from you all, either here, either here or if we run out of time tonight at the pub, if the, you guys are staying around. Um, next slide. Um, yes. Okay, well, so we call what we do cultural resource management. So cultural resources we define as archaeological and historic sites from evidence of past human activity, obvious. The management part of this, though, is actually the process of dealing with archaeological and historic sites. In other words, following um, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, as we'll hear about a bit later. So from now on, I'll just use the acronym CRM so you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so, so what I'm going to do, so, what I'm going to, so while I'm going to focus on the post-World War II period, there were some important developments in the early 20th century, some of which include the 1906 Antiquities Act, the establishment of the National Park Service by the Department of the Interior, in 1916 and the passage of the Historic Sites Act in 1935. Among other things, this particular act also organized the National Parks under the National Park Service. Um, however, none of these developments, as important as they were, created a broad public national awareness. So although I'm by no means, and I mean underlined by no means, a scholar of the post-World War II period, I find the development of uh, leading up to the passage of the, of the National Stock Preservation Act in 1966 kind of interesting. Because after the World War, there was a significant growth in, in the urban population, um, resulting in the term baby boomers, which I'm just about one. <laughs> um, also, the economy was growing as new technologies were established and important developments in the aeronautical and automotive industries uh, allowed people much more mobility than before. Something we take for granted now, television, afforded people the opportunity to, to see and learn about areas of the country and the world that they had not seen before. So they developed an appreciation for the country's national parks, and with the growth of the automobile, Americans could now visit the parks, and they did so in numbers. With the outside world opening up, people began to look for alternatives to living in overcrowded urban centers, hence the growth of the suburbs in this period. And you can see my family moving to the suburbs in 1959. No, not quite. Now, these images really convey, convey though, what began to happen, particularly in the 1950s, where that is a white middle-class population leaving the cities for developing suburbs. Um, Sorry, this is interesting too. With the demand for travel came a need for new roads, but at the passage of, the, of President Dwight Eisenhower's National Interstate and Defense Highways Act of 1956 provided that. But interesting though, the act was created with the idea that highways would facilitate troop movement should the country be attacked by land. Um, but what this actually did was open up the country for people using the automobile to see parts of the country that were pretty much inaccessible before. 
So, unfortunately, what highways also did was destroy the rural and urban landscape, which did not go unnoticed. And here are two examples from New Jersey, I won't mention them, you can see them up there, that were actually built before the passage of the 1956 Act. So, with this, <laughs> I love this, some of this. Um, with the substantial and consequential effects to the rural and urban landscape caused by federal initiated construction programs, including roads and highways, um, people began to take notice about what's happening around them. And as you can see, there were, there were demonstrations. Protests grew in numbers as highways were often built through the paths of least resistance in America's cities. And at the same time, but at the same time, there was also a growing appreciation for the country's architectural heritage. And I find this next slide incredible, actually. Um, there were numerous protests against the, the indiscriminate demolition of our city's architectural gems. This included the beautiful Beaux Arts style Pennsylvania Station in New York City. Um, demolished in 1963, pieces of the architectural beauty were buried in the New Jersey Meadowlands, possibly side by side with some of New York and New Jersey's most notorious mafia victims. So uh, a perfect storm was developing and this led to 1966, an important year, as I mentioned before. Um, let's have a bit of fun here. Of course, the music scene was alive and well. And we have albums by the uh, Monkeys and the Beach Boys in, in the US and across the pond. You had a pretty notable album by the Stones and the Beatles. You guys, a lot of you guys can remember that. What else happened in 1966? Come on, somebody. Oh, you would say that. Come on, just stop one person, give it to me. I'm wasting too much time here. I need, no? Well, the World Cup, right? Come on, guys. Uh, it's the only, it's the, only time, it, the only time England won it. And I was the youngest player ever to play for England at age 14, um, hoisting up the cup for all to see. And I, I see examples of British dentistry here, too. You've seen Nobby Styles' teeth. I mean, he's missing about four of them, so no fluoride in the water, then, I guess. Anyway, enough of me for a while. I'm going to hand you over to Ellen Turco, who will speak about the National Stock Preservation Act of 1966, for, uh, responsible for the growth of CRM in the US. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, if not, just yell. My name is Ellen. I'm from North Carolina. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which is sort of the overarching regulation that we all work under in the US. <clears throat> also, uh, full disclosure, I'm an architectural historian, so I'm often the only architectural historian in the room at, at some of the ACRA meetings and maybe here as well, I don't know. Um, so I have a little bit of a different, different perspective on the work, but we all work under the same laws for the most part in the U.S. So the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, as Rich pointed out, was built, uh, built on existing federal programs and created new tools and processes for carrying out historic preservation in the U.S., it has been amended many times, but the act's basic structures and purposes, processes remain intact. Most importantly, the act did a lot of things, but most importantly for us, um, it created our National Register of Historic Places, which is our nation's list of buildings, sites, structures, objects, and districts that we all agree are worthy of protection. The act also created the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which is a sort of interesting independent government agency that's appointed which comments on adverse effects to historic resources that are caused by federal projects. The act also allowed each state, territory, or federally recognized Indian tribe to set up a state historic preservation office. Um, we fondly known as SHPOs or SHPOs, depending on what uh, part of the country you're from. It's not the most um, elegant name, but that's what we call them. Um, SHPOs support preservation efforts within their state, and SHPOs also play an important role in the Section 106 process. So what is the Section 106 process? You ask, well, this, you ask the Section 106 process is part of the act um, that says that states and federal, that says that federal agencies must take into account, and that's the key words there, take into account, historic properties when carrying out their projects. The project does not have to be paid for directly by the federal government um, to fall under Section 106. It just has to have some sort of federal hook. So as CRM practitioners, we are often acting on behalf of an applicant who is seeking to use federal funds or requires a permit or a license or some other type of permission. And we really sometimes feel like we're delivering the baby, working with our clients, because a lot of times they're not sure 
why they have to go through this process. So we have a lot of education um, in many cases that we have to do with them. Federal projects can run the gamut from massive transportation projects like road and roads and bridges to solar farms that are on a few acres to new banks that are backed by federal deposit insurance to programs that provide housing. So we look at all kinds of different types of projects. So the Section 106 process is pretty simple um, in theory, not so much in carrying it out all the time. Uh, the current steps are one for the federal agency to initiate the project. So that's easy enough. Um, then the agency must identify historic properties in what we call the area of potential effect in our lingo, so basically the project area, and to evaluate these identified properties using the federal National Register standards. Then the agency must assess effects of the proposed action on the historic properties. If there's no historic properties in your area of potential effects, process is done. Um, Lastly, the agency must seek to avoid or mitigate adverse effects to a property by consulting with the SHPO, the Advisory Council, and the project stakeholders. Um, it's important to point out that Section 106 is at, at its core a consultative process, and ultimately the agencies must demonstrate only that the pro properties were taken into account during the planning phase. The 106 process has no predetermined outcomes, and it cannot stop a project. Sometimes the process ends with the loss of a resource, um, but oftentimes it, it results in the protection and preservation of a resource and sometimes the enhancement of a resource. Section 106 aims to balance the protection of cultural resources with federal agencies' programmatic responsibilities. So that is sort of a tension inherent in the process sometimes. The system is not perfect. So very quickly, I want to note the broad effects that the 1976 amendment to the National Historic Preservation Act had on our American CRM industry. The 1966 act, the original act, addressed federal actions that impacted properties that were listed on our National Register. So in the early years of the program, there weren't actually that many properties listed on the National Register. Um, and the properties that, that were listed uh, were often very highly visible places, such as state capitals or battlefields or places associated with very important historical figures, say George Washington or someone like that. In 1976, the act was amended so that the Section 106 process included properties that were eligible for the National Register. So from that point forward, there was no procedural distinction between was made between properties that were listed and those that were just determined eligible. The 1976 amendment set the stage for the growth of the CRM industry because now the identification step of the 106 process went beyond just consulting with our federal list of National Register properties and made and, and the CRM industry had to seek out historically important places by conducting research and on the ground surveys of architecture and archaeology before you didn't really have to do that you just consulted the list it was on the national wasn't on the national register no matter how significant it was the process stopped so the 76 amendment created the need for a core of professional archaeologists this is what archaeologists look like in the US anthropologists, architectural historians, which I am one, and, and others capable of understanding the significance of resources, often at a very local level, because we have uh, the National Register allows us to recognize local, state, and national significance. Um, the uh, professional CRM folks also need to have facility applying the standardized National Register criteria, which provides, in theory, a standard, uh, standardization across the US, um, but is interpreted somewhat differently from state to state and agency to agency in reality. The 76 Amendment also ushered in a slow and still incomplete shift to the types of resources that we consider. CRM practitioners, federal agencies, and American society in general is coming to recognize the diverse and enmeshed histories of historically mar marginalized groups, such as Black Americans, Gay Americans, Native Americans, and immigrant communities. So as I noted, I'm an architectural historian, so I'm going to finish, wrap up with a picture of a building. Um, this is the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village, New York. This was the first LGBTQ site in the country to be listed in the National Register in 1999. 
a year later in 2000, it was it was uh, um, made a national historic landmark. So that's the highest level of recognition that we have in the U.S. Um, places like Stonewall probably would not have been considered for the National Register in, in 1966, in the early days of the program. However, the basic structure of our act has allowed our understanding of historic significance to evolve, and the 106 process, when it works, gives consideration to the most fragile and underrepresented historic places. And that's time for you. So, with the establishment and enforcement of these various regulations, it would appear somewhat surprising, I guess, that the National CRM Trade Association was not formed until the mid-1990s, but there was a catalyst for the formation of ACRA um, in, in, uh, in and It came about because of a scare felt by the CRM industry from what was known as the Republican Revolution of 1995, when four, rather, sorry, when Republicans took a 54-seat net gain in the House of Representatives. The new Congress slashed funding for many federal programs, including the agency that administers the laws which govern our work. So fearing for the fate of CRM, a small group of archaeologists established ACRA with the primary purpose of being active in Washington for the interests of our industry. So since its formation, ACRA has grown to become a national trade association for CRM, both supporting and promoting the common interests of the firms in our industry. Um, I thought, thought it would be useful today to speak briefly about how fast ACRA developed. Uh, the very first issue of ACRA's newsletter, the ACRA News, gives us a good idea of the composition of the association. At, even at that time, it consisted of a board of directors with 20, 21 people and five committees. It also had its own internet list server called ACRA L, a discussion forum for its members. ACRA also solicited the services of an outside government affairs firm to inform its members of the various bills being drafted, which might have a positive or negative effect on our industry. The first issue of ACRA News focused its attention on ACRA's first conference, which was held in Washington, D.C., appropriately enough, I guess. Eighty members were in attendance. The very first meeting, 80 members were in attendance. Um, and there were many workshops covering many topics. And attendees, attendees included people from the fields of archaeology, history, architectural history, architecture, and planning. This is actually an important point. ACRA is not only comprised of folks who just do archaeology. In fact, CRM includes firms and individuals who are specialists in architectural history, history, and historic preservation, just to name a few. Um, and we go on to our membership. Un unlike, well, like FAME, I guess, ACRA is a company-based membership association, so individuals cannot be members, with one exception, students. Our members are primarily firms which practice CRM either as independents, like my firm, or as part of engineering and environmental firms. We also allow colleges, universities, and government agencies, and the like, to join ACRA as associate members. Membership dues are based on a firm's annual revenue in cultural resources work. You guys, I think, it's based on the number of people in your organization. Um, so, so ACRA, uh, so the cultural resources, a firm's grouped by ACRA as large, medium, and small. One advantage of membership is that everyone in that ACRA member firm, college, or government entity can participate in ACRA. For example, an ACRA member can bundle any of its employees, colleagues, or students, notify ACRA, and each will receive all the benefits of membership. Uh, so I'll go through, I don't need to do that, committees. Okay, Kenneth asked me to discuss what ACRA achieves, and I'll do this in part by highlight, highlighting some of ACRA's committees. The Academic Collaboration Committee has developed its university partnership program, which aims to create stronger links between CRM firms and universities. Uh, the program recognizes universities that prepare their students well for a career in CRM. They are evaluated based on how their programs address the list of topics, including basic print, print business principles, and ethics, to name a few. There are about 20 universities which have successfully come on board. This initiative is particularly important given the current trend towards reducing the size of CRM-related programs in schools, and in some cases, closure of programs altogether, which I know you guys have been dealing with over here too. Another important committee on here is the Continuing Education Committee, because through its webinars, it focuses on increasing the business effectively of, I always get that, I can never say this word, if, if, I always, it's not on there, never mind, forget it. Uh, efficacy. I always get trouble, have trouble with efficacy. Um, anyway, of CRM firms advocates for the CRM industry and thus improves the practice of CRM. Um, and then there's the Small Business Committee, a relatively new committee that was formed out of the Membership Committee. This committee was established because over 50% of ACRA's members were small business firms, uh, and it felt by many that their voices weren't being heard. 
So the committee is comprised of young professionals and has become one of ACRA's more successful and active committees. The committee has developed surveys of small business firms to better understand and ultimately address the needs of ACRA's small businesses. And of course, the, uh, the granddaddy of them all is the Government Relations Committee, which works out with the outside consultant to keep traffic developments in Congress. In fact, once a year, we have an event called CRM Day on the Hill, where we talk to our government representatives about the importance of what we do. This has been most beneficial over the years and is organized by our outside consultant. Any ACRA member is encouraged to join the fun in Washington, so to speak. Um, interviews were arranged with representatives from the state you are from. So, for example, in my state, New Jersey, just last month, I spent 30 minutes with one of my representatives, uh, staffers from the House of Representatives. I discussed with her who we are, what we do, and what ACRA and firms like mine have achieved. The ACRA members who were there were prepared beforehand by our outside consultant about some of the bills coming up for discussion and those where we needed the support of our representatives. So in the meetings, we focus on discussing the importance of these bills for our industry and encourage our representatives to support them. Um, I'm, run, I'm rushing through this a bit, but I'm going to give you all the high points, I guess. So we also, have, we also have kept the tradition of having our annual conference that Kenneth has attended now maybe three or four years in a row, something like that. This year, it's going to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So you're all welcome to attend. And Kenneth said he would foot the bill for anybody who wanted to go. Chuckle, chuckle, right? Um, so I'm sure Amanda would hate me showing her photograph to a group of people in the UK. But anyway, the appointment of an, of an executive director, ACRA's first full-time salaried employee in 2018, has had a tremendous effect on the stability of the organization and has provided a framework for internal growth. The association needed someone who is 100% dedicated to the goals of ACRA, and Amanda's appointment has provided strong leadership for our, for our organization, encouraged members' participation in ACRA's many committees, and has supported the development of new, new, new initiatives. But even before Amanda, ACRA had become the largest CRM trade association in the world. Ken, if you told, I didn't realize that, but yeah. Um, but since her appointment, ACRA's membership has grown considerably. In fact, before her appointment, we were at about 130 members. Our membership is now at 217, which is about a 59% increase. So that's pretty damn good in uh, less than 10 years. Um, one of the reasons uh, for this increase in membership is the development of member benefits beyond advocacy. I won't list them all here. I'll just show them to you. I won't describe them all, I should say. In concert with Manda's encouragement, we expanded the few member benefits we already had and added many more. And you can see them here. So everything I have been discussing has led to what I call strength from the inside. And here are some of the characteristics of the strength. Obviously, hiring somebody like Amanda in that position, having that presence in Washington, and then through, through Amanda's encouragement, the establishment and growth and strength of committees run by dedicated volunteers. So with the internal growth and stability of ACRA, I felt it was time to expose ACRA more to the outside world to create what I actually called strength from the outside. And actually, I, I'm sorry about that. I put the last slide up. We'll move along, though. So although not, although not a comprehensive list, I came up with the following. You know, visibility at universities and colleges, well, the, ac the Academic Collaboration Committee, I talked about earlier, kind of does some of that. A pres presence of professional organizations, annual conferences. Um, at, the, at the SAAs, uh, Chris's uh, organization, uh, on, on a Saturday afternoon from 12 to 4, I think, um, CRM firms are allowed to display themselves in, um, and students come by, uh, finding out more about what we do and, and obviously to try and find jobs. It's been incredibly successful. So we'll continue to do that. And then something I want to focus on in closing, something I feel really strongly about and proud about, is the partnership program. So I want to focus on that. It was formed out of the membership committee. Um, and I believe for an organization to be in a position to implement a partnership program, that organization must be internally strong, which, has, as I pointed out, I believe ACRA is today. Without that inner strength, it is likely that an organization would not have the ability or even interest for its mostly volunteer members to manage partnerships and get the most out of them. Such partnerships can easily become dormant and may, and may even be terminated by either organization if they're not seen as working. So with a healthy organization in place, ACRA's partnership program was established in 2019 and exemplifies the term strength from the outside. The idea for the program came from when actually Ellen and I were staffing an ACRA booth at an annual meeting of the National Association of Environmental Professionals in 2017. I noticed they had sessions often presented by folks from ACRA member firms. So I also saw other things that, I, I, that they did that I thought would benefit ACRA. But so long story short, that association became ACRA's first partner in 2019. We have had many successful joint webinars, including one that was attended by over 150 people. So, oh shit, I pissed the, did I piss the wrong one? Why is it? No, I'm not done yet, I'm not done yet. I've got to get, 
There we go. Sorry, guys. Poor Salam. I know you wanted to get me off the stage, but you have to wait a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> so, in 2020, we partnered with you guys and then the Canadian Archaeological Association, registered professional archaeologists, and the Society of Military Engineers. A partnership agreements are set up to benefit both partners and they can help lay the groundwork for all kinds of initiatives moving forward. Partners need to work together and support each, each of what each of us does. For example, we wrote a letter actually in support for fame a few years ago uh, over a concern you all had for the Scottish Government planning and architecture's draft MPF4, which would have on, only permitted identification and evaluation action on LDP known assets and would not allow for similar consideration of previously unknown assets, a bit like what Ellen I think, was talking about before that amendment of 1976. Um, so luckily, I think that was successful, right? Didn't, yeah, good. Uh, so, through, through ACRA's partnership with the, with the Canadian Archaeological Association, we have been working with CRM firms in Canada who are desperate to establish a trade association there. I just got back from a conference in Saskatoon where I was in a panel discussing, a discussion about this. As a follow-up, we have had virtual meetings with a handful of those individuals who want to be actively involved in getting a trade association established. But again, this shows the value of successful partnership. And here we are today with another one of our partners, Fahim. So how can we work together in a more consistent way? The last slide, guys, then you can applaud. Um, so let's go through these briefly. Establishing a working group to discuss ways we can work together on common issues. Um, have annual joint webinars on relevant topics or issues where we can share thoughts about common issues and ideas. Um, again, Ken, Ken's representative of Idea 3, your presence at each other's conferences. Maybe have a panel discussion every other year on, on, on partnerships. Um, and then supporting each other on important issues, like the Scottish example I gave and the example for the, the Canadian Archaeological Association. So that's where we are. I'm very proud to be part of ACRA. Um, not paid for being part, neither is, neither is Ellen. We just enjoy doing it. And uh, it's great to be here today in probably the oldest building I've ever talked in. Uh, before. But um, that's it. Now you can applause.